Hi, Sarah, I'm back from my cup of tea, if anyone's got any uh, questions. Uh, So, um, just out of curiosity, has anyone uh, listening um, used C++ before, or are you all mainly C programmers, or Fortran, or other? Now, so what are you doing here? <laughs> So apologies that the first one was probably teaching you to suck eggs. Have you tried uh, much C++ 11? I found it was quite, uh, after after getting over the R value references, and I find it a great improvement, personally. Yes, uh, changing an older code can be difficult. Uh, if David has a question. If I pass address of x, if x is a pointer, Okay, can so in what context are we talking, David? It was, so is um is this when you're declaring your function? So um, something like void to int reference x is that the sort of thing you mean or Yeah, so um, when you call it, the variable that you pass in has to be convertible to reference to an integer. So it could be uh, an integer, because obviously that converts, or it could be a variable that is a reference already, and that wouldn't take a reference to the reference. You can never get So, okay, Harvey, I'll come to your thing in a second. So, I'm just trying to pass David's query fully. Yeah, so uh, if you want to have a pointer to int in your thing and you want to pass it into this foo function, you have to dereference the pointer to pass it in because your local variable is a pointer, not an integer. Does that make sense? Yeah, so whenever you have a function or something taking an argument that's a reference, you can pass in the raw type. Okay, so Harvey was asking about source organization. So Harvey, I think I misunderstood your question before about uh, um, where you declare the operator plus. So. Um, 
just like C, you have to make sure all the declarations are visible in your headers uh, for the users of your code. So you have to declare operator plus. And whether that's inside the class definition as a member function, or whether it's outside the class as a non-member function, uh, that doesn't matter. It's still got to be visible in the header to the calling code. So if you declare, so, um, yeah, so uh, in C++ there's this thing called the one definition rule that means that anything you define, not declare, you can declare things arbitrary many times as long as the declarations are identical, that every definition must uh, occur exactly once um, unless it's uh, marked in line and template instantiations are implicitly in line. Um, if that makes sense. So as a for a best way to put uh, definitions and declarations in header files, so you include them in exactly the normal way and uh, the best way, well, yeah, I mean, you put the declarations in the header files and the definitions in uh, your C file, your .cpp files. Um, that's usually the best uh, best approach. So templates have to always be visible to the user, the full definition. And there's a sort of a special case in the language about um, allowing them to be multiply defined. Does that make sense, Harvey? Okay, great. So Anton is asking why C++ 11 uh, over the uh, later ones. Um, I'm not, I'm choosing C++ 11 because it is universally supported to a reasonable approximation of universal. Um, you know, it's now uh, seven years ago, uh, any compiler, any system that's not in installing compilers that are new enough to deal with it properly uh, is uh, failing, uh, providing a good service, uh, in my opinion. So uh, that's kind of the my minimum, the minimum standard. The, there was a very big step change from um, the previous standard of C++ here, which was 1998 to C++ 11. It was long overdue, um, and it's really forced a major change in the way people uh, code things. Uh, C++ 11 to 14 was a very small uh, change. It's basically a bug fix release. It's uh, tweaking a few things that were not quite right uh, and adding a few missing pieces. Uh, C++ 17, I'm not super familiar with, to be honest. I've not uh, not done any um, real projects using that. So um, I can't comment. But at the moment, the support in compilers is not amazing. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, for example, Archer didn't have full C++ 17 support on the, um, from the compilers there. Um, and to be honest, I don't have enough expertise in that to really uh, give, give a good summary. Um, there's a lot of good uh, summary articles and talks from like CPPCon and other of these things, they're all on YouTube. Just looking at that link. Uh, yes, so uh, that's all quite interesting. Yeah, like the things that are most interesting from C++, from my point of view, is structured bindings, uh, the optional thing, and um, uh, const expression lambdas are, in my opinion, the most interesting things. But I'm sure plenty of people find things Talk about right. Okay, I should share my slides. How do I do that? There we go. And get so, going. Um, Rupert, just to say that they just noticed that the um, the session finishes at five. We can fix that for next week if that's an issue. But we do need to finish by five. We may get chopped off at five. Sorry, I need. Okay, to so that. I will try and not uh, waffle too much and just get the point. But again, I'm very happy to have questions online. 
I'll just mention now, um, because this was a course, originally a course that we taught, there are some practical exercises and uh, there is a GitHub repository that does not currently but will soon contain the exercises if you wish to do that. Uh, actually, no, it does contain one of the exercises. It also contains the slides as well. So if there's time at the end, I'll briefly discuss that. But obviously, if you wish, they're there if you wish to look at them uh, and maybe try out some of the things I've been talking about. Uh, how do I make this full screen? There we go. Right. OK, so thanks, David. Yes, that's great. The art website will point to these uh, as well. So. OK, what, what I'm not talking about today is uh, how to choose the right algorithm, how to uh, do, uh, structure the biggest scale of your applications. And oh well, um, apologies for leaving this uh, introductory course in, encouraging the students to take the parallel design patterns course. Uh, um, but basically, what we want to look at here is taking a sort of bottom up approach and talk about how to implement these patterns efficiently using C++. That's really the goal. Going to partially achieve that, I think. Um, and really, what we're trying to do is um, uh, talking about sort of the HPC and data science type communities. You know, what you actually want to do is get lots of data to a CPU core, do something interesting to it, and then store it somewhere. And really, this is why Fortran is still a force in uh, the HPC world, because it is, you know, that is what it does best. Um, but in my opinion, the problem with Fortran is that it forces you to confront this uh, representation of your uh, data and code all the time. And like I said earlier, um, C++ is all about building your own abstractions and, how, and composing them. And I'm uh, going to try and put a few little rules of thumb in these slides, um, things that I think lead to writing uh, code that's relatively easy to understand and will give you at least decent performance. So uh, one one uh, pattern thing that's used all the time if you're writing uh, C++ is containers. So uh, a container is a thing that holds other values. And the standard library has uh, 13 classes, uh, container classes that are all templates based on what they contain. Um, but I'm, I'm only going to mention really four, uh, well, six, but two of them are pairs. So vector, which is a dynamically sized contigu contiguous array. This is your, as if you go, you malloced a chunk of data and accessed it element by element. Array is a sort of statically sized contiguous array. So it's just like a vector, except you set the size at compile time. Um, list and forward lists are uh, doubly or singly linked li lists, lists uh, that um, uh, basically use pointers to go from uh, element to element. And then set and map, which are uh, sort of um, key value type things, or just keys, keys only in the set case. So vector is, um, if you're going to do anything numerical using C++, is basically going to be your best friend. Um, you're going to use this all the time because the elements um, are contiguous in memory. So this means that if you want to iterate through a list of things and do something to each of them, the prefetcher on your modern CPU will just pull these through as efficiently as possible. And you're not jumping all around in your address space. So um, if we have some function that is going to uh, return a vector of primes um, up to some number. Um, we're going to create our answer. We're going to uh, iterate through the, uh, the, the natural numbers up to our maximum. And if it's a prime, we're going to put it onto the list. So even though this is uh, perhaps going to be allocating quite a lot via the push back thing, which uh, I'll talk about a bit more in a second, um, it's still what you should use by default, because usually your data locality wins over algorithmic complexity. Um, 
unless you are really, really doing big arrays. So things that you can do to a vector, you can copy it. So it by default supports copying of the whole uh, thing. Um, you can move it, so that's good if you're returning one from a function. Um, you don't have to uh, do a big reallocate, allocate a whole new big chunk of memory, copy all that data across and then delete the old one. You can just move the whole thing. You can uh, do random access uh, by uh, index into the array. You can resize, uh, sorry, my phone's binging away there. Uh, you can resize uh, the um, the vector, um, and you can also pre-reserve your um, uh, memory. So you can say, okay, I know I'm going to need a million elements in this, and then uh, just um, pre-reserve that space without actually saying that your vector takes it up. You can insert and delete elements. Um, and we say that um, a, the vector owns the thing that it contains. So when uh, when it's destroyed, the contain elements will also be destroyed. It will re uh, it recurs in and destroy call their destructors. Um, it's also worth being aware that um, if you resize it, uh, either explicitly or implicitly, it may force a complete reallocate reallocation and copying of the entire content so far. So array is very much like a vector, um, except you can't change the size. Um, you have to specify it in the type of the value. So for example, oh, Declan's saying you can only see my desktop. So uh, what can you see? Yeah, because uh, the thing I can see looks fine. Declan, maybe you should just refresh the browser page or something. I don't know. I'm afraid I don't know much about Collaborate. Okay. Okay, so um, to array, you have to include the array header file and then you can, the type of one of these things is here. So it's a template that takes a required two parameters. The first is the type of the thing you want to have. And the second is the number of things in your type. So what I'm doing is I'm making a type def of this thing as a grid point. For example, if I want to represent uh, the th a three dimensional coordinate on some sort of lattice of points in my simulation or whatever here. And so I can create these, uh, quite easily. The only difference uh, in the way you use them is the way you construct them. So because it's fixed size, you have to provide all the elements when you do it. So point one is uh, P123 in the sort of assignment way. Um, if you want to uh, create one, you have to use this slightly unpleasant double brace syntax um, because of quirks of exactly how these so-called initializer lists are passed in uh, if you're using C14, you can drop the extra one and just uh, have a single brace, which is much nicer. And uh, you know, if you query them for their size, you'll just get three as a compile time constant. Okay, so this is sort of initialization by assignment, the first one, and the second is sort of direct access to the um, the constructor, there's no real difference. It's mere, it's really syntactic. Okay, so um, if we're dealing with lists and borders, these are it's not required by the standard, but every implementation I'm aware of uses uh, linked lists. So they're either doubly or singly linked lists. Uh, so elements are allocated one by one on the heap. And if you want to iterate through this list, it requires chasing some pointers. Um, the thing that's nice about this is you want to uh, be able to quickly insert and delete uh, elements. Um, 
but that only applies if you don't have to search for your element at all. If you do have to search for these things, the overhead of doing all that pointer chasing compared to just having a vector of these things um, can be quite bad. Um, but it's one of these things that you just have to test it and try different things. So, but the times that you want to use these is if you're going to be adding and removing elements a lot, and particularly if uh, it's from either end of your list, uh, because you can get fast access to that, or if the contained objects are very expensive to copy or move. So, quite a common pattern that you get in code is that you have to build something where you have to insert things. Uh, at different locations um, in a sort of build phase, but then uh, you will not be changing this after your sort of setup phase of your simulation or so on, and you've got a sort of um, thing. You might want to convert it to a vector after you finish building it um, if you've got one of these sort of build then access patterns, and um, that's something that's uh, done successfully in the past. So for set and map, these are what's called associative containers. So they're actually implemented as a sorted data structure that's very fast to search. So set is just the keys only, and a map is a set of key value pairs, a bit like a Python dic dictionary, but it's uh, they're maintained in the sort of sorted order rather than using uh, a hash table. So the key and the value can be of different types. For example, you could have things keyed by a string, and there the value contained is some complex object. Um, but you have to be able to define a comparison function for the key type, at least. And basically, you want to use these if you've got a very large but sparse key space, or if you're going to be looking up unpredictable values a lot, or frequently adding and removing items from this thing. So, for example, if you have a domain decomposition type problem uh, using uh, MPI ranks, so if each on this little uh, cartoon of a, an airplane, if each uh, color represents one MPI ranks worth of data, um, you know the red one here will be communicating with the pale green and orange, but none of the others. So, you know, in your um, setup phase. You might create a map of these uh, from integer to boundary communication objects in some way. So you create your map, which I'm calling rank to cons. And in the setup, I iterate over the whole MPI communicator, uh, wherever I got that from. And then I query. So I go, if I share a boundary with rank P, then I create a boundary comms thing from my rank to the other rank and store it in this map. And then later, when it comes to accessing these things, I can just iterate through the ones that I've got and quickly get access to these things to send data to my uh, neighbors. Um, sorry, the, the domains that neighbor my domain um, in some sort of neat way. Right, so iteration. So this is one of the sort of fundamental operations that uh, we we do in computing. So the sort of thing that you're used to seeing as a C programmer is something like at the top. We've got the number of times we're going around. We get some data from somewhere. We store it, at, uh, store a pointer to that data, and then uh, we go from uh, i being zero, i not equal to n. And then we increment i each time we go around, and we say double the element, the ith element of our data array. So if you're a bit more old school, especially if you're sort of systems programming type thing, you might prefer to be uh, dealing uh, with the pointers instead of an index. So we create the pointer uh, at the start, while the pointer's not uh, our in condition increment it and dereference the pointer to double it. So um, that's uh, sort of quite a sort of KNR style of uh, programming a loop. 
so these sort of uh, these three pointers that we were just talking about the start the stop and the current one uh, can implement the, uh, the whole concept of, of um, traversing every element in our collection uh, in order and it's also um, modeling the concept of an iterator which is uh, a concept that uh, sort of permeates uh, bits of the standard library and it's um, important for using the standard library effectively so there are a few different types of these iterators you can go a forward iterator which will only go one way through uh, the range of uh, values a backward one that's the opposite a random access one which lets you jump around and access an arbitrary point within there but they all they can all traverse the elements of something you know whether it's uh, the data in a container data in a file input from a keyboard uh, that would obviously be a, only a forward iterator and um, they can provide access to the data as well as controlling the iteration so a sort of traditional c++ 99 equivalent of the last thing would be um, be this so if we've got data uh, we get data from somewhere it's a, a vector of data of uh, some values we say that for every iterator um, we declare an iterator variable iter here which is of uh, a long and complex type so it's a standard vector of doubles and this contains another type um, called the iterator type so it's a nested type uh, and we say that the, this starts off as data dot why did I put start that should be begin I'm so sorry uh, data dot begin Uh, and we keep doing a loop while this is not equal to the end of the data array and we pre-increment uh, to go to the next one and then inside the loop body we just dereference the iterator uh, to get at the actual data value and scale it by two so or equivalently in a more more modern C++11 style uh, we can use the auto keyword to avoid having to type that long slightly complex type we can just go auto and because the compiler knows the return type of that function uh, it can infer it for us and just use that there so is that Harvey perhaps slightly tempting you to use auto okay slightly tempted so you know, this is very similar to the to the previous one except slightly briefer so you might be thinking why am I why are we talking about this when I can just write uh, for I equals zero up to n um, so really you know you're you're starting to separate the different concerns we can separate the data and how it's stored from the way it's traversing it we're going to traverse it and also from the operation we apply to it so uh, by separating concerns we can then compose them more easily so for example we could create a template function double in place that is parameterized by an iterator type uh, and all it does is it accepts a start end pair of iterators and it will uh, apply some operation to every element starting from start up to but not including the end one and we could do this for just as before with a standard vector of doubles or we could do this with a list uh, which is the um, doubly linked list data structure I mentioned before of some huge matrices and we literally don't have to change anything right the compiler will generate all the code for us and this will be uh, quite efficient so container iterators so um all of the standard library uh, containers have uh, two nested iterator types within themselves they have a an, uh, a sort of basic mutable iterator and they also have the const iterator so to use a mutable non-const iterator your instance your container instance must be non-const and you can get that with begin or end um, and use the const ones you can either 
explicitly request the const one with C begin, C end, or if your instance's const just begin and end will return the constant iterator, which means this is an iterator that can be modified in itself, but it, you cannot modify the data that is pointed to within the container, if that makes sense. The other way that you often end up getting iterators is if you're doing something like find on a standard map or, or standard set. So if you search a map for a key, what you'll get back is an iterator that points to the elements that you wanted or the end iterator if um, it couldn't find it. Um, and it's worth pointing out that um, an iterator that points to the end is not valid. It cannot be dereferenced because it's the element just past the last one. Okay, Harvey is asking, can you add or remove elements of the container within the iterator loop? Uh, the answer is it depends and you have to read the documentation. So for standard vector, you cannot reliably do that because the uh, you don't know if it will reallocate or not. So the uh, documentation makes clear whether uh, that's allowed or not. Uh, it will say whether it invalidates the iterators or not, adding or removing elements. Uh, does that make sense? Great. So if you want to implement your own iterator, uh, you need to create a class, and this needs to have several um, several uh, overloads. Um, and exactly which overloads you have to provide uh, depends on the type of iterator you want. But the bare minimum is you need to have the dereferenced operator, so uh, star iterator instance. You need to be able to dereference your pointer to get the value that's contained. You need to be able to pre-increment it, so plus plus the iterator, so which sort of represents going to the next uh, value. Um, sort of uh, getting in with the question, why why not post-increment? So I'll, if you're used to C, you may be used to writing I plus plus rather than plus plus I. Um, the reason is that um, the, the it plus plus uh, operator overload has to return the value of the iterator from before it was incremented. So this usually means that you'd have to create a copy uh, and then update the current one, uh, if you see what I mean. And this is a little bit wasteful. So this is why uh, C++ programmers are drilled to write plus plus it rather than it plus plus. Um, uh, what else? You, you need to be able to um, assign ones. You need to. Uh, uh, assign, define your um, operator assignment. Uh, that's fine. And you need to be able to compare these things. So you need to be able to see, um, know if you're done, basically. So if you create a class that uh, has begin and end member functions that will return iterators, um, like all the standard library containers, you can use uh, these in a range-based for loop, um, which is a sort of almost Pythonic way of doing it. So if you create a standard vector of things, let's say it's these primes, I get uh, the first five primes. Uh, then you can write your iteration over the elements like this. So for auto p colon container or container-like thing or some sort of expression there, uh, um, and then p will just be the value that is pointed to by the iterator each time range. So this will print 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, uh, as you might hope. So it's obviously syntactically much nicer. What's really happening is that behind the scenes, the compiler is translating this to us. So it creates some uh, sort of hidden variable um, based on your range expression was the uh, right hand side of the colon here. And then it has a sort of standard uh, um, C++ style iterator 
loop over it. Begin is something, end is something, while the begin is not equal to the end. And then we increment the one that our, our, iter our iteration variable each time around. And then inside the loop, just before the loop body is executed, I assign the variable, the left hand side of the colon, uh, to the result of dereferencing the iterator. So this is very nice. You can write much, uh, much neater looking code without having to worry too much about iterators uh, as the end user. Obviously, the implementer needs to care. So someone, before we started, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, uh, asked if there was uh, any overhead to doing these sorts of things. So uh, I've done this for you. So we're going to quickly compare a sort of standard C style array indexing, the standard vector with the old school iterator and uh, the range based for loop. So we've got a very simple problem that gets data of some size based on the command line arguments uh, and just going to fill it with a random number and then going to call the scale function. This scale function here that is much like the double one uh, talked about before. It's just going to iterate through every uh, every element um, there and multiply it by 0.5 and print the time. So uh, if I don't use any optimizations, you can see that this isn't great. So I don't know how well this comes through online, but you can see that the, the C style one uh, is doing pretty well, except for the smallest sizes. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, and it's doing about a factor of two faster than the range-based for loop and the iterator loop. This may just be noise, the difference, because I would have expected that the iterator and range go um, quite similarly. But this, is, this isn't surprising, because um, in this thing, we are doing actual uh, function calls rather than a simple int uh, increment. So if the optimizer doesn't not doing anything, it's not going to inline any functions. There is the function call overhead, so it's no surprise that this is a bit worse. But as soon as you turn on any optimization, uh, these turn out to be basically indistinguishable from each other. Um, and if you um, if you stick your loops into um, either Godbolt or um, just dump the assembly uh, from your compiler. You can see that these are pretty much identical. The only difference is, for some reason, uh, the one on the left, which is uh, for the C style one, has not been unrolled at all. Uh, I don't know, this is, this is um, yeah, it's been vectorized, but not unrolled. Whereas this one, which is in fact the range based for loop, the range based for loop and the sort of um, C++ style uh, ones gave identical um, assembly code, actually. This one has been unrolled by a factor of two. I don't know. Uh, but the, the assembly is um, basically identical, except for that. OK, so kind of the, the, the big one, the thing that might be a bit confusing, um, difficult. So Object orientation in C++. It's one of the major paradigms supported by the language. Um, so quote from Wikipedia, it's based on the concept of objects, which contain both data and executable code. And a feature of this is that an object's procedures can access and indeed modify the data of the object with which they're associated. So earlier, I um, covered that the, sort of the real basics of uh, how you do create a simple class. Uh, and we'll do a little bit more now. So inheritance is one of the major features, which is a way of dividing, deriving a new related class from another one. This is so-called the base class, the parent class, or the superclass. And this relationship says that the derived object also, as well as being its own type, it also is indeed of the same type as the base class too. So this new class, this derived class, child class, subclass, it has all this, the same data and function members of its parent, but you can also add new ones and override existing uh, functions. 
Um, and the derived class member functions can also access the base class members are public, that are public, but not the private ones. Um, they are specific to that one class. Um, but there's in fact a, another access specifier that's called protected that uh, allows derived classes but not unrelated classes to access these members. Um, you need to be careful about allowing, about using protected um, because basically you're promising to any subclass that this interface won't change, of course. So use with uh, a bit of caution. But let's let's suppose you've got to process an awful lot of image files. So you might start off by creating a class that represents the JPEG file and the data contained in it. So it's got members like the file name, uh, the number of pixels in the X and Y directions, and then you're going to hold a pointer to the character data that's the pixel data. Let's just assume it's black and white 8-bit uh, images. So this unique pointer is a standard library type that maybe uh, we'll come and talk about uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, and then we provide a constructor that constructs one from a string of the file name. Uh, we set the file name in the initializer list, and then we read read some data from the header. We set the uh, we allocate an array of the um, to hold the character data of the appropriate size. Oh no, I'm assuming it's uh, RGB eight bit. And then we do some work to decompress the data from the file, and then we can provide access to this data with some sort of get pixel function call that. Uh, here you give it the x and the y coordinate, and it will return the appropriate thing for you. But you know, but then you know you start working on this store, you realize you need to support a whole bunch of other uh, image formats, etc. And you want to do the same thing, code duplication. The types uh, are totally unrelated, so you'd have to write either uh, some rather careful generic templated code or write uh, completely different code to handle these things. So. Instead, what you'd probably think about doing is create some sort of base class and um, some derived classes that specialize this to the particular format. So this might be our base class, this just sort of generic image file, uh, which has a file name and an image size and some pixel data. And uh, we have a way to access a pixel of that. <coughs> um, and we can, um, when we create one, we construct one, we can allocate the, uh, sorry, we can set the file name. Then um, in the derived class, like for the JPEG file we were talking about before, uh, we can have exactly the same constructor, except that it sets the file name by calling the base classes constructor. Uh, we do the same reading as before. And then we can do the same for a Pung file and so on. You know, the constructor would be. Uh, would contain the specific stuff for reading the uh, header file. So it's important to know that um, one thing that's uh, thing is a, that a pointer or indeed a reference uh, to a derived class, for example, this JPEG file, is uh, type compatible with a pointer to the base class. So you can create a JPEG file here so from some cat, cat.jpg, and then you know you can assign uh, an image uh, reference to that same thing. So the values are compatible. And this allows uh, this behavior called dynamic polymorphism. So if we have some operation that we want uh, uh, want to vary between the subclasses, for example, writing the image data contained in that uh, object to a file. So ideally, we want to have a uniform interface. And then when we call it uh, at runtime, the, the pointer uh, the pointer to base class, which is the thing that we want to operate on, it knows somehow which uh, of the derived types uh, member functions to call. So this is tackled with uh, so-called virtual functions. So skipping everything except this uh, writing part of uh, the 
classes, uh, what we do is in the base class, we declare that this is a virtual member function. It's called write. Let's say it just takes a single string. Oh, another typo. Uh, accepts a, uh, a thing, and we say that there, it's equal to zero. And what this is doing is saying that in this this base uh, class, I am not providing uh, an implementation. I am going to. Uh, this means that you can't ever instantiate an image file directly. You can only ever create a subclass of this, and provide a concrete implementation of this abstract uh, member function. So for example, in the JPEG file uh, class, we, which inherits from an image file, we would have to provide, uh, we can provide the implementation of write for this particular type. So you know, we write some header information, we compress the actual data and write it to the file. And so when we come to use it, we can have image as a pointer to an image file, and we create it from some, uh, we assign that based on a JPEG file that we initialize from this file name, and then we can tell it to write itself to some other file, for example, possibly after doing some manipulation or processing and so on. And um, so one thing that I got, uh, I've been asked is like, you know, how does this actually work? What's, what's going on? So it's, it creates this thing called a virtual function table. So each uh, class basically has a static table of function pointers that point to the code of its virtual function. So the compiler knows these because when you declare a virtual uh, member function, it will add a row to this table uh, so, uh, to hold this information. And when uh, the um, object is created, uh, the compiler will fill in the, the virtual function table for you based on the concrete type when it's created because it knows it at that point. And then when it comes time to call this um, function, uh, the compiler will add instructions to indirect to look up the appropriate value in the virtual function table, and then it will uh, call that function uh, pointer. Uh, so this is clearly adding some overhead, right? So um, uh, because you know, a you've got to chase some pointers, and b you can't inline the function. So inlining of functions is key. It's a key compiler technique for getting high performance. So this is not something that you want to be using uh, inside your inner loop for uh, you know a billion elements per. Uh, time step that you're, of your simulation, but by all means use these things outside a um, an inner loop. For example, if you have a class that contains very many molecular dynamics particles, for example, you might have that thing's type might might have that thing might have virtual functions to deal with the processing. But once you're inside that virtual function, there's no further overhead. So um, yeah, so that's the, the end of this uh, material. So I'm very happy to take take questions. Okay, uh, Harvey's asking when will the GitLab be updated? So uh, GitHub currently contains uh, the first practical. Uh, and uh, I think the second lecture, so I, I think that's just the source, not the compiled versions. Uh, so uh, yeah, the first set of exercises is, is, uh, is online now. I will double check, I'm sorry, it's been a bit hectic this week, so I haven't had a chance to make sure everything's up to date. Uh, the uh, exercises, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to find the right bit of right directory in my terminal.
I'll get the uh, exercises online probably tomorrow morning. Uh, so, um, and yeah, so um, if anyone's got any questions about the exercises, uh, the practical uh, things, uh, you feel free to send me an email. Um, I can't promise a quick response, but you'll get one eventually. Okay, so um, yeah, so Carthy's asking about um, overheads for using object-oriented programming. Um, no, I'm not, because the short answer is it totally depends. Um, uh, using virtual functions, for example, does introduce a small overhead every time you call a function, but you know, what with branch prediction and so on, the, the hardware and compilers conspire to make it a very small overhead, but it is real. Uh, it may, if you're lucky, it might be, you know, uh, less than 100 instructions. Uh, but, you know, if you're doing that, say, you know, once per time step and your simulation's running, you know, one time step every, uh, you know, millisecond to hour, that's basically irrelevant. But, you know, if you're running it inside an inner loop, it could be uh, quite significant. But, you know, in other cases, using some of the object oriented can, uh, you know, it can uh, help you write code that is uh, easier for the compiler to optimize if you, um, if you uh, use inlining and interprocedural optimization, things like that. Does that make sense, Carthy? Okay, OOP, Alcarthy is following up saying OOP means we have an array of structures. Maybe, yeah. And, you know, it depends, right? If you're doing GPU programming, that will probably suck. Uh, you know, you want a structure of arrays and, um, but, you know, it depends, right? I can't give you one answer. You need to be aware of what, of what the computer is actually going to do when you, when it's compiled and uh, reason about it that way. Okay, cool. Um, so Bob Fletcher's asking about recommendations for using standard Valeray. Um, yeah, so uh, I have also heard it may be uh, deprecated. I do not know how true that is. Um, I have never used it. I do not think it is adequate for doing uh, real numerical computing. So I would say probably don't use it. Um, uh, if you just need a multi-dimensional array type, um, they exist, just Google, find one that suits your purposes and seems to be maintained, uh, you know. Okay, David and Carthy are arguing about what good object orientated programming means. Um, uh, I don't know. I am not particular. So if you if you do like a traditional OOP in the sort of Java and old school uh, C++ style, you will end up with this sort of object soup of everything being uh, having to follow pointers and having too many layers of indirection via virtual function calls and the performance will suck, yes. Uh, you know, you're basically writing Java. But um, if you're genuinely doing something more performance oriented, yeah, your objects um, will be arrays, because an array is an object as well as the things that, the elements in it. And there's nothing stopping you from creating a lightweight wrapper iterator type that makes each which pretends to be the contained object allowing all the usual method uh, sort of member function calls and so on on that data on a row in your table, for example. Cool. Okay, so Ranga's asking if I can give a simple or, or real life example of uh, 
sort of from our HPC world, we're using C++ 11, et cetera, is much easier than coding in C. Um, yeah, so I, if you come to the next one, I've got a few snippets from real code that I have written and used that uses some of these uh, things. Um, hold on. Let me see if I can find the right one. So one thing that's uh, seen used is this sort of thing, which is not terribly um, C++ 11-y, but it is a little bit, uh, in, in creating these sort of um, fairly generic fun function objects that uh, will do perform a single operation on a range of data. So this is using some of the the reason it's quite it's a bit only a bit C plus plus eleven is using auto because obviously your iterator types here uh, could um, no sorry I'm talking nonsense this is just fairly traditional C plus plus right but this is one way that it's uh, giving things uh, great. but it's really kind of the ability to fairly easily uh, decompose things into their chunks and then concretize them at uh, compile time. So for example, the Cocos library from Sandia Labs is uh, a very good example of using um, sort of the power of C++ to um, really, really win at, at numerical computing because it allows you to abstract many things. For example, the, the way that the data is laid out, where the data is stored, which memory space, um, uh, the way you're iterating over it and the operation that you're performing on each thing. And to pass these little pieces, to separate these things from each other and then combine them in the right way for your architecture at uh, compile time. Is that um, helpful at all? I'm going to talk about this in two weeks' time uh, in some more detail. Okay, good. Uh, right, so I'm just going to sign off now. Um, happy to take uh, any further questions, queries via uh, email or on the RSE Slack channel. Uh, there's a C++ channel there, uh, and you will get more than one opinion if you post there, which may be beneficial. Okay, thank you, everyone.